This is Distant Replay, the podcast that goes back in time to relive all the greatest events that we witnessed in sports. From upsets, to championships, to cultural moments, we discuss it all. Coming up on today's episode. How about that? Overtime for a possible birth of the national championship. Who had 6-6 six, six as a final in regulation in this one? My gracious. Well, you probably can pick up on which game this is just by that clip. And even though it wasn't a highlight per se, it kind of tells you exactly what this game was all about. It's Alabama, LSU. Some call it the game of the century depending on who you listen to, and it is the focus for this episode of Distant Replay Podcast. Welcome in. I am Ben George alongside Mike Noto as we get started on another game. We went back to 2011, Mike, on a game that we enjoyed together. Yeah, we watched this game together in uh, Ben George's condo, and man, I I remember watching it there, and this game, when we went back and watched it, I didn't remember as much as I thought I did about this game. It it was incredible. Well, me neither. Me neither. And let's just go ahead and jump right into it and talk about where we were. So you mentioned my condo. We were both in Connecticut. We've talked about on the show that we were both at ESPN for a little time. And um, we had gone tailgating earlier in the day. This is a huge game, okay? Now, keep in mind that like up in Connecticut, now you can find a lot of SEC fans at ESPN. But for a while before the SEC Network started, there weren't a ton of them. Uh, it was rare to find a fellow Southerner in Connecticut. So I uh, I was kind of the spot for college football Saturdays because most people were NFL fans up there like yourself. And, of course, when Alabama had a big game, everybody wanted to come watch. And we had a nice little party for this. And it started off with tailgating at the rent in Hartford for UConn Syracuse. I didn't go in the game. You went to the game. I said I can't, I can't bother with sitting in this awful UConn Syracuse football matchup before the biggest game of uh, my life and our lives as football fans. And then we went back and watched it in my house. So we're going to talk more about how this game played out in my house as we go on. But that's kind of the background on this one. And and to kind of get, if you forget, if you've forgotten at all about this game, we're going to get into it in, in quite a bit of detail. Let me remind you first about a couple of things. You can follow us on Twitter at Distant Podcast. You can uh, email us at distantpodcast at gmail.com and you can find our website and all the show notes and links to watch every single game that we talk about in its entirety at distantreplaypodcast.com. So Mike, this game, setting it up, number one, LSU. Don't forget, LSU was number one at the time, not Alabama. November 5th, 2011. So this is one of our more recent events that we've done and this one took place at Bryant-Denny Stadium. So of course, why would we pick this one? It's It was one of the biggest regular season games that we can remember. Absolutely. And let me just recap the great job by you that you just brought up here. For those of you who maybe weren't completely following what Ben said before, the guy tailgated for a noon UConn kickoff, then went back to his condo and tailgated up until this game, which was a night game. Yeah, it was either 7 or 8 Eastern. I don't remember which time. So, this, so Ben was tailgating from about 10 a.m. to, let's say, 7 or 8 p.m. So th- that sets the scene for us watching this game, probably more than anything else you could say. But this game, this game, the build up to this game, all right, was unlike much I've seen in college football. I mean, you had obviously professionals all over the field, and it was a game that you were looking forward to for multiple weeks because you knew both these teams. They had a history the, the couple years leading up to this playing against each other, and now you were finally going to get them both undefeated at the same time, and it was one of the few games that, that matched the hype associated with it. And keep in mind, too, I think there was a bye week before this game for both teams, much like there is this year. And that's kind of the other reason why we picked this game for this week is at the time of this recording and, and the release date, Alabama LSU were on the collision course again to uh, play another huge undefeated everything on the line type matchup again in uh, in Tuscaloosa. So we wanted to go back and watch this one. But I'm glad you pointed out the length of time that I tailgated because that also is the reason why I don't remember as much of this game as I thought I would have with it being only eight years old. I had to fill in a lot of gaps in this spot, especially as the game went along and into overtime as we'll get to. So as we think back on this, Mike, what did you remember most about this game before going back and watching it? I didn't remember as much also, for some of the same reasons that you just hinted at, <laughs> as why you didn't remember, to be honest, because remember, I was tailgating and hanging out at football games and went to your house right after the UConn game. So, uh, 
Didn't remember a whole lot play by play. The one play I did remember though was the Eric Reed interception. Yep. That was the one I did remember, and you know the only big moment I remembered. Yeah, that was same for me. And and it's funny because as bad as field goal kicking's been for Alabama, I didn't remember it being as bad in this game as it actually was. Uh, surprisingly, you think I would remember that, but it was actually worse than I remembered, if that's even possible. But also to set the stage for this week too for us and for this game, just kind of give you a little background on also what was going on. Connecticut had just had a snowstorm where we were living over like a foot of snow or two feet of snow in October. And it ended up being like nobody had power this entire week. So it was a mess of a week where like I was one of the first people to get power back like three days later. I still had friends that didn't have power until this Saturday. And I think that's why we had more people come over to watch this game was because people still didn't have power a week later when the storm hit. Do you remember that? That storm was intense. So for those of you who maybe don't live in the Northeast or didn't live here or it was, I think it was Halloween that yep. year in 2011. Basically, none of the leaves had fallen off the trees yet, or very few had. So when we got the snow, the leaves and the snow and the ice weighted down the trees. And I remember clearing the snow in my driveway, and you could hear trees snapping all around you as you cleared the snow. Yeah. It, and, and it led to all these power outages that Ben was talking about. And that's a great point as to why there was a lot of people at your place watching this game, and that was probably why. Yeah, so that's a little background on, on this game. So let's move into it and begin with kind of setting the stage. We've done it a little bit. You, you touched on it being such a huge matchup with a lot of a lot of buildup on basically everywhere you looked. I mean, I remember ESPN covered this thing as much as it could have, but for, for a good reason, because this was the first regular season matchup of one versus number two since 2006, that Ohio State-Michigan game. So we're talking five years since we'd seen a matchup like this. And then plus on top of that, I mean, honestly, these were the best two teams. I mean, you look at the stats, and especially defensively, I mean, everywhere you look on that defense, total defense nationally, Alabama ranked one, LSU two. Scoring defense nationally, Alabama one, LSU two. Rushing defense nationally, Alabama one, LSU five. And on the offensive side, now, Obviously, defenses were further ahead than offense on these two teams, but the offenses weren't bad. They had, they still had talent. In the SEC, these two offenses ranked second and third in scoring, so they were still putting up numbers. It was just that these defenses was, were so far ahead of each other uh, in terms of looking at all the talent on the field. Yeah, first the defense. There's one stat to throw at you from Alabama. Up till this point, up till this game, they had only allowed nine trips in the red zone the entire season. Crazy. Which is nuts. And now, with that said, when we went back and watched this, I thought the offense has played better than I remembered. Okay. And better than I remembered, they still didn't play good. Because what you had in this game was you had LSU in that dopey two quarterback <laughs> system, which is 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 unbelievable. I, it's, I still we'll get into this more later, but that never works, and it didn't really ever work for them. The games they won, they just overwhelm people. Whenever they played anyone with equal or better talent, that two quarterback system doesn't work. And this was the first game that I can remember AJ McCarron looking a little bit deer in the headlights type. Yeah, maybe his first really big game because I think what he. Tell me if I'm wrong, but when I always think of AJ McCarron is from this point going forward in these big games, he was even a little more than the game manager type quarterback that you were used to from Alabama. No, I think that's fair. And I think you can kind of, I mean, I hadn't really thought of it until you just made that point, but you can probably look at this game as kind of being that point in which he turned the corner. Now he was pretty good. This was his first year starting. He was a sophomore. You know, he'd go on to win a lot of games and really be one of the best quarterbacks Alabama had had in terms of uh, wins, in terms of yardage, because this is a, a, a team that traditionally ran the football primarily. I mean, you mentioned that game manager that we became accustomed to, Greg McElroy. John Parker Wilson was a little more dynamic than that. But, you know, you look at A.J., he was really the best quarterback Alabama had in some time. Now, that's since been a race with Jalen Hurts and, and Tua, but he was really good. I think this is where he turned the corner. But I think it was fair to say that he did have some moments where – he looked a little tentative and released the ball a little quicker than he probably should have and made some errant throws. But, I mean, look at that secondary he was going against. I mean, can you really fault that performance? Yeah, that secondary was something else. I think it was a combination of him being a little nervous and McIlwain and Saban not trusting him as much as they would moving forward. I think it was a combination of both. But that secondary for LSU, that may be why they had pause to really let him, you know, cut loose in this game because that secondary featured Morris Claiborne, who was a top 10 pick, Eric Reed who's still a safety in the league, and I and Tyron Matthew. I can't believe I missed Tyron Matthew, 
who may be the best pro out of all of them, mm-hmm. all in one secondary. And you, and this is a team that the year before had Patrick Peterson as well, who had left for the draft this year, um, if I'm not mistaken. So, you know, you had those three guys and Patrick Peterson recently in this secondary, and it, it, that was an impressive unit. You know, when they showed the starting lineups before the game, I was like, wow. Yeah, you might have forgotten about how, how just how good that team was defensively, and they had a ton of talent, and we'll get into that a little bit. But I think one of the one of the more fun to matchups to watch in this game, as you mentioned, uh, Matthew, him and Drake Kirkpatrick got after it quite a bit in this game. Just really, really in special teams only, because that's really the only time they, they matched up. But it was quite a storyline in this game and, and was a key moment at one point. But the other part of this matchup, and I think uh, most people know this, but not everybody probably outside of the SEC or you know guys that aren't really tapped into college football, and that's the storyline of Nick Saban and LSU. Because at this time, we're, you know, we're talking five years into Nick Saban's tenure at Alabama. The wounds were still very, very fresh in Baton Rouge. I mean, they, they, they still hate the guy. They probably respect him a little more now than they did at this point because of how quickly they, they left. He left town and went to the Dolphins and back to their rival. But keep in mind, though, people forget, like, LSU is a national brand now. But before Nick Saban got there, and LSU fans aren't going to want to hear it, but LSU wasn't much of a college football program. They had huge fans. They had some big games. Sure, they they had a huge fan. One of the still one of the best fan bases ever. That never dropped off. But I mean, consider what they did in the series before Nick Saban arrived. Alabama had won nine out of eleven before Saban got to LSU in two thousand. Okay, this this series was completely Alabama. Alabama had like a, a forty year streak, maybe thirty year streak of never losing in Baton Rouge. Thirty years they never lost once in Death Valley. And uh, Nick Saban changed that entire dynamic. And you'll see in the gra- on a graphic in this game, or one of the trivia questions they asked, but Saban was the first LSU coach to ever beat Alabama four times. So as much as LSU fans hated him, that, that kind of adds that extra dynamic to this game. And you bring up a good point about LSU overall. Much more of a national brand now is a great point. And they showed a graphic in the beginning of this game. They were 8-0 to start the season leading into this game. So first time they were 8-0 since 1973. So we're talking, yeah. we're talking almost forty years there without going eight and zero. Um, and if you would have told me that, I, I would, I would have been surprised. I, w- I was surprised by it when I watched it. And you know, I thought an interesting dynamic in this game was, you know, you had Saban got to Alabama in 08, correct? 07. 07. 09 was the first championship. Yep. Ten was the Cam Newton year, right? Too soon, but yeah. Yep. So 2011 now is a season where, all right, Nick Saban won a championship. LSU's on the rise. Alabama's just starting to become that institution that we know now. You know what I mean? So this was still a big game for in the legacy of Nick Saban and Les Miles. And I thought that was an interesting vantage point to look at this game from. Yeah, yeah I think. Because I think we saw these coaches a little more nervous than we would in the years to come after they were more established with the way they called this game. No, you're exactly right. That's another part of it is when you think back to where this when this game was played, completely different than where we are now. You you mentioned it. Alabama had won a national championship, but then came back and lost three games the next year, which is the last time Alabama actually lost three games in a season, 2010. But there was still there was no verdict out. But it wasn't like there was this. Yeah, this team year in year out is going to be in the the playoff for the BCS championship. That's what everybody, especially in Tuscaloosa, wanted to believe. But that wasn't an absolute fact at the time. There was still a hey, you know. He's really good. He could still leave at some point. We don't know what his future holds. There's only one championship. I mean, and it also felt because of those same reasons that in Tuscaloosa and in Bryant Denny on this in this crowd and this this atmosphere felt different. You go back now. You go to a game now. There's still some really good crowds, but I don't think you you get that hunger that these fans still had. I mean, not to take away anything away from the fans and what they do now. I mean, they're still great crowds and really great atmospheres. We'll see another one in uh, Tuscaloosa when LSU plays this year, both undefeated. But there's just something about that when you when you don't have all those wins piled up and you're still kind of hungry for that national championship, it, 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 it reflects in the crowd. And this was a great, great environment. Oh, that environment was great. And Look, I've had the fortunate opportunity of when Ben moved back to Tuscaloosa to go to uh, three games down there, and what a place. If you, if anyone listening here has never been to an SEC football game, it's sort of like when you go to Vegas and then try to go to another casino. <laughs> it just doesn't match That's up. Great. You'll never want to go to a professional football game after you go to an SEC game, and I had the opportunity to see the number one team in the nation play every time I went there. One year, it was Dak Prescott and Mississippi State who was number one against Alabama. But great place. So I just wanted to mention that. But you're right. There was a sense of nervousness, a sense of, hey, can we do this? And maybe not as much, you know, nervous confidence is how I would put it. 
Yeah, exactly. And, you know, at this time, too, Alabama had won in 08 and 09. But besides that, LSU had won six of the last eight. So it was still like this whole, can we get over the hump against LSU factor as well? So LSU still kind of had that over Alabama at the time. So all those dynamics play into this game and what made it so special and why we picked it for obvious reasons, besides it being number one versus number two. There was just so much, so many uh, subplots to this game going into it, including us watching it at my condo, which we'll talk about more. All right, let's get into the game itself, Mike, and begin our game discussion And as we always do, let's begin with outdated observations. Now, this game's only eight years old, so there wasn't a whole lot that I can mention. Scott Cochran, Alabama's strength coach, had hair. That was one of the outdated items. There really wasn't a whole lot that caught my attention in terms of, oh, wow, I can't believe that, except for maybe some of the rankings of some some programs that we saw over the course of this game on the ticker and on the highlights. That, that stuck out to me, too. I have, It's amazing how we watch these games. We don't talk about this game at all before we start recording this. I know we've said that in the past, but just to reiterate that. But the one thing I have for outdated observations is how good Arkansas was he- heading into this game, while only one loss, and how good uh, Oklahoma State was heading into this yeah. game undefeated. And they showed the list of undefeated teams at some point in the middle of the broadcast, and I remember thinking, wow, I can't believe some of these teams are undefeated. You know, Oklahoma State led by Brandon Whedon, just to throw out a name I'm sure you haven't heard in a while. <laughs> so that was that was that that stuck out to me. We've hit a run here where a lot of the same teams are in the mix for the now college football playoff, and that was definitely stuck out. That was That's a great point. Yeah, and you mentioned Arkansas. In this and in, in kind of the overarching storyline, too, of this game was BCS implications. You know, we were this is pre-college football playoff. So, you know, this game, ultimately people thought this game would determine who would be in the BCS championship. It was a de facto playoff game. Now, come to find out, that was not the case after all. But that's kind of where it felt. And part of that equation was Arkansas in this mix. Arkansas was a top five team this year. And I had completely forgotten about that because of how bad Arkansas has become. And, you know, Nick Saban's never lost to, to Arkansas, and that was part of it. You know, even on this very good team that Arkansas had, they got blown out by Alabama and LSU that year. But those were the only two losses. The SEC West had three of the top five teams in the country that year, and it was pretty wild to think about because I would forgotten how good Arkansas was at one point under Petrino before he decided to uh, hop on his old motorcycle and go for a joyride. But uh, <laughs> that's where we were in this game. So no, not many outdated items to, to speak of. So let's get into the broadcast. And it was CBS, as we mentioned, Vern Lundquist and Gary Danielson, our old buddy, Uncle Vern on the call. Did you enjoy listening to him? Oh man, I love Vern. And and if you've watched SEC football in the last 10, 15 years, you know, I like Brad Nessler too. I think he's very good. I thought he was good when he was at ESPN. I think he's great now. But there's just something about Vern. Because just when you don't think Vern has any clue what planet he's on or what he's doing, <laughs> he comes he comes in with something so enlightening and puts something in such an eloquent way, and it sort of takes you back. And I think that was the charm of him, to be honest. And I don't mean that in a disparaging way at all. I mean it dead serious. And and Danielson, is just he's a great analyst. Uh, he was just on the local sports radio station here. He does a weekly college football spot, literally on my way here to to tape this podcast. And he's even great on radio. Uh, He has such a way of explaining the game to you from the college football perspective that you don't get when you listen to the professional announcers. This is a great, great broadcast team. Tracy Wolfson's a solid as well on the sideline. Great great broadcast team. Yeah. And keep in mind too. So this was the first time, you know, we've become accustomed to Alabama LSU being played at prime time. I mean, that, that's that been kind of the thing. But remember, this game was a 2-30 game for a long time, but CBS actually worked out a deal and made a trade with ESPN this year to move this game from 2-30 to its 7 o'clock uh, central start time. They announced this trade in October. Uh, they basically swapped games and had some future scheduling considerations for the 2012 season they gave back to ESPN. And since that time, CBS has kept that game in prime time. Now, they had a huge screw up this year, opted to go Notre Dame, Georgia as their prime time game this year, thinking LSU maybe wouldn't be as good, thinking maybe Georgia, Notre Dame would be uh, a really good matchup by the time the season was over, could be two playoff teams. And now it turns out they're going to have to air this one in this regular time. So they still have the game, but to not have this one in prime time, which it could be actually an even better game with the offenses now, I think it might have more interest than teams watching two great defenses. But that's kind of where all this started. So, you know, it's come full circle now, eight years later, but that's uh, originally how it started. People forget that was actually a trade between ESPN and CBS to make that game work out. 
I, I had I did not know that, and I did notice when I was looking at the schedule for this weekend that this was a a three thirty game. I know you call it a two thirty game because you lived in the Central Time Zone most right. of your life, but the three thirty game and what you know the glorification of Notre Dame football. We could do a whole podcast on that if you want. Um, but for them to you know to jump the gun and put them versus Georgia in prime time, uh, a lot of these networks, man, they want Notre Dame in prime time. You know, I guess I get it, but how many you know how many Notre Dame secondaries are we going to watch? get blown by good teams in prime time over the years. Yeah. I don't know, man. It's it's they they're regretting the decisions they've made this year. It's not been a good year for their scheduling uh, team at all. But into coaches, Les Miles, Nick Saban, we talked about it. Les Miles was in his seventh season at this point at LSU, Nick Saban in his fifth. Uh really just a classic matchup and you know, Les, we're starting to see him a little resurgence up at Kansas, doing some good things there with that program. But as we kind of saw in this game, it's, it's really Les Miles' inability to adapt that's really kind of held him back at LSU. Uh, maybe he's changing that way of thinking a little bit at Kansas, but you could kind of see that. Uh, and, and really at this point, Nick Saban hadn't, hadn't changed his ways either. So not to not to uh, give Nick Saban all the credit in this game. But, you know, Les Miles is a solid coach, but this was kind of the beginning of the end for less this season not this specific game but later on this season yeah and i don't know if you saw the in the open they showed both coaches giving their pump up speeches in the locker yeah. room those pump me up man and i'm not that kind of guy that gets pumped up by pregame speeches that are given to teams that i'm not on <laughs> but those those speeches were awesome and these two coaches look back then you couldn't get two coaches at more of an opposite end of the spectrum <laughs> You know, Les Miles seemed a little less buttoned up from a scheme perspective and from a personal perspective than Nick Saban, right? Les Miles over the years took more chances than Nick Saban uh, with different plays that he ran, fake field goals, you know, things of that nature. And like you said, with Les Miles, I think all that stuff sort of caught up with him eventually. Saban's still ticking as strong as ever. Another quick observation. I'm glad you mentioned pregame. I, I thought Nick Saban seemed a little nervous in his interview in the pregame interview, a little more so than he does now, per se, but seemed a little more, uh, speaking a little quickly, didn't seem as confident, didn't really stutter or anything, but just didn't seem like his cool self, as we usually see, and I think that just kind of tells you how big this game was. Players on each side, we dive into each, kind of break down the rosters. We're going to talk a little bit more about how good these rosters were, but key players really in this game, A.J. McCarron, starter for Alabama quarterback, you touched on it a little bit, first year as a starter, Trent Richardson, the running back at Alabama. We will, I'm sure, discuss how his career ended up. And then the defense, obviously, for Alabama was the big thing. Who on Alabama really had you forgotten about in this lineup, Mike, when you went back and watched? I forgot about – I didn't forget about Dante Hightower, but I forgot he was on this team. Obviously, he's, he's gone on to have a very good professional career with the Patriots. I forgot how not that great their receivers were. <laughs> yeah, they, they didn't seem to have many receivers, didn't have a great tight end. That really caught my eye uh, more than anything else uh, for Alabama in terms of their their offensive side of the ball. Yeah, and their offensive line had a lot of names that I remembered as well with Barrett Jones um, and DJ, who was the tackle? DJ Fluker. DJ Fluker. Chance, yeah, Chance those are a lot of names you remember. Was, Chance Warmack. Yep, yep, yeah. Yeah, yep. and and I and yeah, I think that's a good point with Alabama's receivers. You know, we we see now Alabama's got the best receiving core in college football, but for the longest time, I mean, they just, they would recruit guys that were good and had talent, but were not elite. I mean, just because of the system Alabama ran, no great receiver is going to come to Alabama and get three targets a game. And um, they did have a really good player, Marquise Mays, who made some big plays in this game and would and make some big plays over the course of his career. And he also he also had two horrendous plays. Yeah, in this game. yeah, he did. He did. Have- I I honestly I'm not big on picking out a goat, and I don't think there was one in this game. But he's a candidate. Yeah, we'll get that to, to that we later. We will uh, on LSU side of the ball. Uh, and let me just quickly say, yeah, Dante Hightower, C.J. Mosley were two of the big. I mean, Alabama was loaded on that defensive side of the ball. Courtney Upshaw, they like the linebacker core is maybe the best they've ever had to this day, and it was not much different than what LSU was, was rolling out there either, okay? So on the quarterback position was was one of the, the – probably the weak link for LSU. I don't think there's any denying that. Jordan Jefferson and Jared Lee were both quarterbacks, both played in this game, both put up awful numbers, and it was just kind of the course of how they played this this season. You know, they never really settled on one guy. Both guys did different things. Jared Lee threw the ball a little bit more. Jordan Jefferson ran an option a little bit more, and uh, they didn't have any huge names on offense except for a receiver where you know Odell Beckham was still really young in this game. I think they had Ruben Randall maybe in this game. So this was a decent offense, but the, the defense is where it is at again. And you hit on the secondary, but they had some good defensive linemen as well. Yeah, they had Michael Brockers, who would become a pro. They had uh, Montgomery, yep. right, who would become a pro. 
the Benny Logan. They had a bunch of, like you said, it, it, this is LSU, Alabama. They're one of those teams. They play the, you know, five, six, seven, eight line defensive linemen a game. Most of them become pros. You can pretty much pencil that in more than any position on the field. And, you know, this LSU stuff with the two quarterbacks, this is the second year they're doing this now. They did it the year before also. Now they're doing it the second year. And it's just, it's incredible to me that a school like LSU, it looks like they finally found a quarterback in Burrow, but that they go all these years not really finding a quarterback. It's mystifying to me when they have talent at every other position. But yeah, you mentioned it, a young Odell Beckham. Interesting fact, Beckham, Ruben Randall, and Russell Shepard all end up at some point on the New York Giants. Yep, um, indeed. Randall and Randall and Beckham sort of underwhelming a little bit, but um, not meeting expectations, I would say. And Shepard uh, coming over as a free agent, I believe. Yeah. So they loaded up and down uh, both of these rosters, and that's why this game was such such a highly anticipated matchup. So let's dive into it. First quarter, run through some of the, the big plays and some of the moments in this game, and and go back through what we saw over the course of the actual gameplay. So first quarter, Bama comes out. Two, two big plays to start, right? I mean, a couple big big chunks of yardage get down inside the 30 or so, but uh, you see LSU's defense for the first time rise to the occasion and really just put the hammer down, stop Alabama, force a field goal. First missed field goal. I thought the interesting thing, though, was Alabama came out and their offense looked pretty good. They had over 100 yards of offense in their first two possessions, but came away with zero points. Two, two good possessions. Right, and you have to put it into perspective here. They're playing the second best defense in the country, right? So for two two possessions in a row to get yourself in field goal range and to miss two field goals is a big letdown because you don't really know. I know it's cliche, but you don't know how many of those chances you're going to get. And Richardson and Lacey both with their moments, Trent Richardson, who we already mentioned, and Eddie Lacey, who I'm sure people out there know, both with their moments in these first two drives and. Look, uh, even when you're watching it, rewatching it, you're like, oh, man, they're going to regret not hitting those two field goals. Cade Foster, a name that every Alabama fan still remembers quite well. Um, he was the one that took uh, the first one, and then Shelly took the second one. No, I don't even remember. But they, Alabama was using two kickers it, as well in this game. And the problem is, And the problem is what you're doing right now. Why are there two kickers? Like the short field goal kicker, the long field goal kicker. I mean, enough. Nick, re- recruit recruit a kicker. It's still amazing to me. Yeah, you have, talked it, about how LSU can't find a quarterback all these years. How can Alabama never find a kicker? It's almost like— Don't you have 80, don't you have 80 scholarships in college? Yeah. A- 80. 80. Take two of those and go g- and, and send someone out and get the best kicker you can. But here's the thing, man. I mean, here's the thing. Alabama has recruited some top kickers, like the top kicker in the country, a couple times, and they get on campus, and it's the same story. It's wild. It, it, nobody can make any sense of it. And and Eddie Pinheiro a couple years ago was an Alabama commit before he, went, before he flipped to Florida late in the process. He probably made the right decision because he's gone on to have a great career and now he's kicking in the NFL. Who knows how it would have played out differently. But that's always been the story at Alabama. No matter how good the team is, the kicking game is always questionable. And it was the story in this game. So Alabama, two possessions, two missed field goals. As Mike mentioned, a lot, to, a lot of positive takeaway, but you come out of there with no points. And and it's got to feel good for LSU. But LSU didn't do a whole lot offensively to start things. And then Jarrett Lee, his time in at quarterback, threw his first of two interceptions late in that first quarter to end it, really. And uh, it was really all Alabama, but on the scoreboard, it's still 0-0. 0-0. And that, those inter- that early interception by Jarrett Lee seemed to really impact his playing time in this game going forward. Again, they do this two-quarterback system, so I don't know the exact, exact snap breakdown. But it seems like we got a lot more of Jordan Jefferson – then we did Jarrett Lee, and like you said, during the short time Jarrett Lee would play in this game, he would throw another interception. I think it almost was like Les Miles just just said, "Look, you know, Alabama's gonna have a tough time scoring on us. Let's just shorten this game and let's use Jordan Jefferson, and just run the ball a little bit more, and not try to pass and make any big plays." Because I don't remember LSU maybe took one shot downfield. I mean, maybe one all game, literally uh, one throw over twenty yards, maybe. It was a conservative, conservative game plan, and it shouldn't have worked, but it did because the game stayed where it was. So into the second quarter, Bama had the ball in LSU territory again to start the quarter. This is actually when they brought in uh, Shelley to to kick the field goal after Cade missed his first two. So they get a block. So Alabama's first three possessions all get across in LSU territory and come away with no points. And you're, you're just sitting there going, at what point does Alabama just start going for it? I mean, I, I know this can be a tight game, but how many times are you going to run out a field goal kicker just to watch the same result? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'm speechless sitting there watching the game. I mean, uh, again, like, I don't know. Who was the long field goal kicker, Shelly or Foster? Like, I don't Foster even remember. Was. It's so confusing. It was so confusing. Like, I don't even remember. I just watched the game yesterday. You know what I mean? <laughs> I couldn't imagine being a fan watching it. I mean, it must have drove you nuts, I, especially when you have, like, 70 other good players on the sideline. Also, also of note is how the special teams for LSU, most notably Brad Wing, up to this point in the game, is, uh, he's actually playing really well and putting Alabama in not so great field position, but Alabama overcoming that, like you said, with three good drives to start the game. Uh, it's, I'm speechless with this with this field goal kicker. Yeah, so. that's what was crazy is Alabama was moving the ball pretty well. You know, not, not, nothing huge, but they had some big chunks, but they were putting together some pretty consistent drives. And then uh, it was really, for, for LSU, there was really nothing to speak of in the first half offensively. And Alabama was able to get another drive into LSU territory and came away finally, first points of the game, and had to settle for a field goal, a Cade Foster, or sorry, Jeremy <laughs> Shelley. <laughs> See, <laughs> we're still getting confused. Jeremy Shelley, 34-yard field goal to take the 3 nothing lead, and, and finally, like a little bit of exhale inside the stadium, like finally got on the board after four possessions of playing pretty well, and Alabama just had a 3 nothing lead late in that. But LSU, credit them, they came back at the end of that, that quarter, and Jefferson led a pretty good drive down the field, and got him down into and, and really almost had a chance to score a touchdown, but Alabama rose up and um, was able to hold him to a field goal. But the big play on that drive was an easy 34 yard completion. I just mentioned no really long passes, and this was probably the only one in the game. And it was really a busted coverage by Alabama that led to it. And it looked like a bad throw from Jefferson. It ended up in the right place. It was a good throw, but it looked like at the time that he just threw it out there and, and one guy happened to run under it. But the replay showed that Alabama secondary really gave up that big play down to the four and Alabama rose up. So, you know, the offense has got down the field, but the defenses continued to keep both these teams off the scoreboard. Yeah. And two, two quick things about those two field goal drives that you just mentioned. The Alabama one, uh, A.J. McCarron missing a wide open player in the flat on that third down. Yeah. He missed yeah. a wide open guy and Saban went ballistic and rightfully so. He threw a, a fade, which Danielson pointed out was the easier throw because it took less time to develop. But Saban going crazy on the sideline because he had a guy wide open in the flat. And then you mentioned, again, the, the, the long pass on LSU's drive to Shepard. Which again, a severely underthrown ball by Jordan Jefferson, but it didn't matter because, like you said, it was just a blown coverage on Alabama's end. Had it been a, a better thrown ball, could have been a touchdown. Uh, but now you have three three at the half, and Rich Trent Richardson over one hundred yards total in the first half. Yeah, he looked really good in this game. And remember, he was third in the Heisman vote this year. Something else to keep in mind in this. He was in New York for this game. A couple other notes from the first half that I wrote down. One, I forgot how much option Jordan Jefferson ran. Uh, that seemed to be one of the favorite play calls from Les Miles on that sideline. And then the other part was, you know, Les always became known for his inability to, to manage the clock well. They almost ran out of time in the first half, even though they got the ball down to the four. They ran a couple of plays, and they had a they had to call a timeout with Les Miles running on the field with a second left on the on the clock. Yeah, and you know that was a confusing sequence to me. But Danielson made it sound like it was smart what Les Miles did. It kind of threw me off a little bit. Danielson's reaction to that. Yeah. But like you said, Les Miles literally ran on the field at like the ten yard line right next to the ref. And and you know Miles, you, you're right about the clock management stuff. It seems like a lot of these coaches, college professional. They have a such tough a tough time with clock management situations. Uh, there's very few coaches that I can even think of in either on either level that really have a firm grasp of, of clock management. Yeah, indeed. And then going to halftime, one thing I'd forgotten, Saban's halftime interview, microphone went out halfway through. So we didn't get to hear anything that really that Saban said at halftime. I'd completely forgotten about that. Was probably deep into the brown water at halftime at that point because uh, back at the condo, uh, the, the nerves were running pretty high. The tension was pretty thick. Back at the Plainville condo at this point, so it was, and just just so so I was in it, like I said, I was in, it was in attendance at the Plainville <laughs> condo, so I was a uh, I can speak from experience. We had Ben there who was an Alabama fan, and we also had a kid who was an LSU fan, and it was one of those games where I didn't feel comfortable saying anything because I didn't want to get yelled at. I mean, it was one of those things where it was a ten- intense game because there was missed opportunities, there was good plays. 
There's the missed field goals that we talked about. Th- this game had a lot of stakes, and for a game that was only 3-3, it had a lot of action. Yeah, and Alabama did not punt in the first half. Speaking of how, how efficient Alabama's offense was, did not have to punt in the first half, but still just three points. So to the second half we go. It really started off Mark Barron, big play to start things off for Alabama. He intercepts Jerry Lee, a second pick. This turns out to be a big play because Barron takes this ball back and almost scores, gets taken down inside the five, but a block in the back ends up taking it back to the 35. So that penalty ended up being a 30-yard penalty for Alabama. And Alabama still so managed to get a Cade Foster field goal, 46 yards. It was good. The second field goal of the game to give Alabama the 6-3 lead. The last points, surprisingly, that Alabama would score. But that was a big play. That Barron interception really seemed like he was going to kind of turn it for Alabama, but only to come away with three points again. Just seemed like LSU was just right where they wanted to be. I had uh, three plays circled here uh, in my notes that I was definitely going to mention. Uh, and that was one of them. That was a huge, I mean, Upshaw was a very good player for you guys, but that penalty was just very unfortunate timing. Cause like you said, Mark Barron, who was a, I don't know if we mentioned him before, but he was a very good college player. And he's a good pro too. Still playing, but, yeah. yeah. He's a good pro too, but that was a huge missed opportunity. They had the ball inside the 10. Uh, and then obviously that, pe- that penalty moves them back, but very good to bring that up, Ben. Cause that was a to me, that was a huge, uh, huge turning point in this game. And at this point, CBS threw up a good nugget. This was the first time all season that LSU had trailed in the second half. So just again, to reiterate how good these two teams were, LSU had trailed for like 12 minutes all season before this game, and now they're behind for the first time in the second half. Uh, LSU didn't do a whole lot in this, this quarter as well. The other thing that I kind of noticed, Trent Richardson, who you talked about, had a great first half. Started to come become really a non-factor in this third quarter. Couldn't do anything. Bama turned a little bit more to Eddie Lacy, which I, I kind of wish they would have given him a few more opportunities because he, he seemed to really get big chunks of yardage every time he went in and got a carry in this game. But they didn't really give it to him a ton. And what you're talking about with Trent Richardson, there was a span here in the third quarter where he had you know six carries for five yards. Right. So they, they made some kind of adjustments at halftime. And we talked about some of the coaches before, and LSU's uh, John Chavis uh, sort of, you know, when I think of defensive coordinators from that era, I think of, you know, him, I think of uh, Bud Foster, Virginia Tech, these guys, and the guy who's at uh, Clemson now, that's been there for a while, his name's escaping me. Venables. I think of these guys when I think of defensive coordinators, you know what I mean? Guys that... Hey, look, they're cool getting paid their uh, one, two million dollars a year to be a defensive coordinator, and that's what they do. And when you have a coordinator like that, he can maybe hide some of the deficiencies that Les Miles has as a head coach, and especially on the defensive side of the ball, and make adjustments at halftime. And I thought he made some very good adjustments uh, bottling up Trent Richardson. Yeah, indeed he did. And kind of this after this kind of point late in the third quarters when things started to turn LSU's way a little bit I mean it LSU did some things and and kind of moved the ball a little bit and had a couple of big plays but still seemed like all Alabama but things started to turn in that third quarter it began with Morris Claiborne a a bad throw by AJ McCarron across the field I think as soon as he released it he realized it was a bad a bad throw try to throw it uh to the sideline Claiborne jumped it an easy pick took the ball all the way down to the 15 yard line with a minute left in the quarter. And at that point, still a three-point game. Alabama kind of back on their heels again, once again. And fourth quarter begins, LSU field goal to tie it. And it was 6-6 at that point. I mean, in which way are you are you leaning at this point? I mean, how do you feel about how this game would play? Was it all Alabama? Was it pretty balanced? What was your overall feel at this point? At this point, I had the feeling that even LSU's running game in this quarter started to pick up a little bit. Uh, at one point, that Michael Ford had eight, like I think it was eight carries for like 55 yards. And then the biggest adjust that we just talked about the adjustment to bottle up Trent Richardson. I sort of I'm sitting there watching it, and I'm like, look, Alabama had a lot of chances in the first half, and now I think LSU is imposing their will a little bit, and I, and you feel the momentum slowly start to turn. I mean, it's a six six game, so it's not like a huge swing of momentum right. here. But you could slowly see the tides starting to turn in LSU's favor. So here's where it really kind of turns for LSU. And this this ends up being the biggest sequence in my mind of the game. So early fourth quarter, it's 6-6. Alabama's got the ball back, kind of responding to that field goal. Okay, they, they, they held LSU again to a field goal inside the red zone. Another great, great stop defensively. Get the ball back. Alabama starts driving again. Huge Trent Richardson run. They're across the 50 again. I think they're inside the 40, around the 30, 35 yard line. Starting at momentum, going to answer the score again. This is when, as you first mentioned, uh, Marquise Mays having a couple of big plays in this game. 
I'm not going to go as far as to say this is a bad play. He makes a bad throw, but Alabama lines him up in the Wildcat, fakes the handoff, has his tight end, Michael Williams, wide open, running to the end zone, throws it a little behind him, and still very, I'm, I'll call it a controversial, I'll speak on behalf of Alabama fans, a controversial interception call on Eric Reed. But Eric Reed makes a huge adjustment, comes off his man, breaks and follows Williams. And Marquise Mays, being the 5'8 receiver that he is, didn't quite get enough on the ball and gave Reed a chance to make a play. And credit Reed, it was a, it was a hell of a play. I'll buy the controversial call. Okay. I'll buy okay, that. Thanks. Okay, I'll buy that. But that play call was ridiculous. I mean, you had Trent Richardson, who, like you just mentioned, got you to that point with his best run of the game. It's your bread and butter. You're Nick Saban. If any, if anything, you're known for not taking chances like this. And put it the ball in the hands of a five eight receiver to throw a pass down the field to a tight end. <laughs> I, it was a ridiculous. It was a ridiculous when you, when you, play. When call. you put it like uh, that, maybe. But listen, look, I don't think they felt like they had a really good opportunity to score a touchdown without doing something a little different. I felt that way, and the play call was good. I mean, Williams was running wide open. If Reed, I mean, any average defensive back or safety might not have made that play, but Reed literally came off his guy because he saw Williams run in front of him and seamlessly picked up Williams and made that play. Look, and I think this speaks more to what we talked about before, where I don't think 100% these coaches trusted McCarron in a spot like this, because you're not doing this if you trust your quarterback with a play call like this. And I don't think there's any really, really arguing that. And look, was Williams wide open? Maybe, but who's Williams? You know what I mean? Like these guys you have deciding this game for you uh, in a 6-6 game, you know, I always just err on the side of when you have really talented players, put the ball in their hands and let the chips fall where they may. Look, it, it was a re- it was a borderline interception, and it was not clear cut. And I get it was a controversial call, but I just don't believe in the play call as a whole. So that was at the one yard line, okay? So still, I mean, Alabama in their best, the best defense in the country has LSU in their uh, very average quarterback situation, backed up to the one yard line. So still not in a bad spot, even though that was those were points off the board for Alabama. They, that catch gets called, probably a touchdown. But Alabama gets a stop. And and something something to mention here, Ben, because I know what you're getting to. Let's not forget Marquise Mays, his ankle is banged up before he threw the pass. True. He did go out in let's, the fir- let's first set, half. Let's, let's just set the stage. I think they, that's ahead. fair. He, he did go out in the first half with the sprained ankle. It was, it was heavily wrapped. He, was, he played really well on it for what it was, but it still was hampering him a little bit. Um, so that did probably factor into that throw. And then it also factors into LSU's next possession. So Alabama gets a three and out, and they're set to get gray field position again in this game when Brad Wing, who turns out to be one of LSU's best players this year in the season, boots his best kick of the day. Now, he hasn't had to do this as much because he's really just been trying to control his kicks most of this game and looking for uh, more of an angle rather than distance. But Boots, uh, this one, as well as he has probably most of the season. And Mays isn't able to back up on it as much as he wants to. Now, I didn't really see exactly how far you know he was off. I think he was like 40 or 50 yards back. So it wasn't like he was in a bad spot. But this ball went over his head by 5 or 10 yards, and he couldn't backpedal enough. So lets it go, and of course it takes an LSU bounce, rolls another 15 yards, and turns out to be a 72-yard punt. And Alabama all of a sudden went from having the ball at about the 50-yard line to, again, being backed up, uh, I think, inside the 20. Now, it was pretty clear to me, and I think Danielson pointed it out, that he went to backpedal to ke- to catch that punt because he had plenty of time to back up, and his ankle gave out. Yeah, yeah you kind of Now, pulled, you got a guy who has a bad ankle, yeah, who has a bad ankle, throwing passes— uh, returning punts, I, I don't know. I, I, maybe, maybe the coaches didn't realize how bad he was injured, but maybe to put this guy in this spot where he has to make these big of plays and this big a game, maybe he wasn't physically capable to do it at the point at that point. But then again, on the flip side, he's the guy who got you to this point, right? So if he's saying he's healthy enough to play, maybe you don't think of it any further than that if you're a coach. Yeah, May, and, look, May, uh, Mays was a tough player, and Mays was the real, I think, game changer on this offense outside of you know the running backs, but. You know, Mays is a guy that could could break a play at any given time, and I think that's what they're counting on. I mean, he was a really good player. wasn't a, a pro or anything, but as a college player, he gets overlooked a lot. But he he made a lot of big plays for Alabama over this two year national championship run. Yeah, and like I said, it, it's one of those things where if a guy's telling you he's healthy and he looks fine, and he like you said, he did make some good plays in the interim here. It's just unfortunate when you see a guy who is maybe not himself 
and he sort of gets put in a situation where two plays don't go his way back to back like this in such a big game. Yeah, so from that point, Alabama moves it down the field a little bit, but is unable to do anything with it. And the, basically, they, these two teams go back and forth a couple times. This clock runs out, and Alabama got the ball back with 53 seconds after holding LSU. And I think they tried to run a little screenplay, hoping that maybe it broke for big yardage and they would maybe do something from there. But both teams were very content with going to overtime, which I thought was a little surprising. I thought Les Miles maybe would try to call a timeout and Gary Danielson mentioned it a couple times that he thought LSU was about to take a timeout, but both coaches were happy getting to overtime, which I thought was a little surprising. I was surprised by Les Miles that he he, he clearly did not mind going to overtime. And one thing, uh, the second to last Alabama drive, when they had that third and 20 and they yeah. threw that screen pass to Richardson, he was so close to breaking that. Yeah, what did he get, 18 yards? Yeah, it was clearly like a play where they're just like, ah, third and 20, let's see how many yards we can get. He was so when I was watching, I was like, I know he doesn't break this, but it looked it looked really that was a you know we're getting on these coaches for the play calls. That would have been a great play call if he got you know five ten more yards. So we got overtime, okay, and then in this overtime again, I think back at the condo, you know, the memories were starting to fade a little bit. Let's just put it that way. But we get to overtime. LSU wins the toss, plays defense first, right call. But buddy, I had forgotten how bad Alabama was in overtime. That was that was easily their worst possession of the game. It might have been their worst four play series of the entire season. The only chance they really had in overtime was that second down pass to Richardson on the wheel route that where McCarron missed them. That was really the only semi good play design and play execution they had, and McCarron just missed them. Yeah. And look, you're setting if I told you before the overtime, hey Ben, um, <laughs> Look, we're going to set up Cade Foster or Jeremy Shelley, I can't remember who, for a 52-yard field goal here. What do you think? You know, <laughs> Probably would have kicked you, you out probably of the ran, You probably would have ran and got the maker's mark. Yeah. Um, so let me just recap. First down, Alabama tries to throw a little uh, inside screen to Trent Richardson, and A.J. McCarron fires it to him, and, and Richardson can't catch the ball. That was first down. Then Alabama proceeds to break the huddle with 12 players. That's five more yards. Then the wheel route, as you mentioned, McCarron wasn't an awful throw, but to a running back, you got to throw it inside. And he made uh, Richardson try to catch it over his head. Richardson could not hold on to it. Then third down, McCarron takes a sack. Okay, the one thing you can't do in this spot. So then, as you mentioned, especially especially when you don't have, you have two kickers, <laughs> when you have Cade Foster and, and Jeremy Shelley on the <laughs> sideline. So Nick Saban taps Cade Foster to come out for the 52-yard field goal. It was not dramatic. He hit it poorly. It went straight left, died on the, in the end zone, and uh, was very anticlimactic and exactly what we expected when they went out there and trotted out the field goal for 52 yards. So LSU had the ball, and LSU was going conservative, very simple. Let's just run this, run this, run this. We got a good kicker. Let's just set him up. Alabama almost made a play. An option got broken. Dante Hightower, who still I think is one of the more underrated players on Nick Saban air, he, he was tenacious in this game, was all over the quarterback, had some big hits. He was right there in position, could not quite get to the quarterback, maybe him or Upshaw, but couldn't quite get to Jefferson, just missed the timing. And then Mark Barron could not make the tackle on the outside, looked like he had him in position. He kind of got blocked a little bit, and it sprung forward for well, it looked to be a touchdown. He stepped out of the seven, but ended up being a 15, 20-yard play. And all of a sudden, LSU's inside the 10, and it was just a matter of time. They kicked the field goal to win it. Nine to six in overtime in that game. The, over, the overtime was – it was tough to watch. It was just such a bad overtime compared to what we've seen for most of the game, mainly with the way Alabama started it. But uh, LSU, just a break, was able to get that field goal. And I don't know. You go back and watch this. I, I I think I gave LSU maybe a little more credit going back and watching it, but to me, I mean, Alabama was the better team in this game. Yeah, and and look, like you said, that overtime was very anticlimactic. I mean, you had a game that it might have been a six six game heading into overtime, but look, we've done a whole podcast on a game that was nine six was the final score. There was a lot of very key plays and a lot of action during the game. Overtime did not match it, like you said, and. One thing is, you know, when you when you fast forward a couple of weeks later and they play in the, in the national championship game, and we all know what the result was to that game, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. When you go back and watch this game, I don't think you could be surprised because I thought Alabama did outplay LSU, and it was one of those things where LSU just made less mistakes. And a lot of times these games, especially college games between two good teams, uh, it comes down to that. Quickly, before we talk about the aftermath, so post-game interview, Les Miles, I thought it was very interesting. He was very confident. He downplayed the game, even saying to um, Tracy Wolfson that the next games were more important than this one. 
you know, and that's coach speak a little bit, but I think he downplayed that Alabama game a little bit. And then Wolfson asked him about a rematch. Hey, if this, if it turns out, do you guys play again? What do you think about that? And Les said he'd be honored to face Alabama once again. I don't think he actually believed it would happen probably at the time, but he felt a little confident coming out of that game. You know, can't blame him. But yeah, to my point, so let's go, let's go post game aftermath in this and a couple of quick thoughts on this game. To me, I think if Alabama would have scored in their first couple of possessions, this game would have been much like the national championship game. Because if Alabama can get up 10 nothing in this game or 13 nothing, or hell, they could have scored two touchdowns out of those four possessions, which they got inside the 30, 14 nothing lead in this game, it would have been over. I mean, LSU trying to throw the ball and catch up would have had no chance in this game. Yeah, that wasn't an option for this LSU team. No. They, they couldn't have come from behind. So if, if Alabama ever does get out to a big lead, forget about it. it, it it's, it's a wrap. So how'd this game impact each team? Well, so this was a controversial season. It's still talked about to this day. You know about it if you're listening to the show, I'm sure. But LSU would go on to win out, beat Arkansas, uh, who was third at the time when they played. Unbelievable. And then beat Georgia, routed Georgia in the SEC championship game. Uh, Honey Badger had a great year, great game in that game. Alabama would go on to win out. So it got to the, the end of the season where Oklahoma State lost to Iowa State in the big debate over who should be in the BCS championship game? Should it be a team that didn't win their division? Should you value the losses more than the wins? Like, how do you do that? Because Oklahoma State on paper might have had a better win versus the, the worst loss was Oklahoma State. A lot of that debating, but it ended up the rematch happened. Alabama and LSU for the national championship in New Orleans, which was one of the toughest tickets I've ever been a part of. As you can imagine, LSU playing a national championship in their backyard against their hated rival. It was impossible to find a ticket, but Alabama destroyed LSU in that game. I think LSU crossed the 50 once in that game, and Alabama won 21 nothing. So this this was really such an impactful season, the way this, this thing played out in, in the aftermath of this game. And what stuck out to me with this whole controversy that you just mentioned where who was going to play um, LSU in the national championship game, I always never understood. If you actually watch this game that we just talked about, how could you not think that you were watching the two best teams in college football? How could you not think that? Right. Why wouldn't you want to see this game again? Um, I think in college football, what you get a lot is, you know, I'm just not going to support this outcome because it doesn't. it's not the best for my conference. You know, it's very, it's very conference-oriented, that sport. And people just can't be fair when it comes down to it, if it involves their, their school or their conference. Yep. Yeah, you know, you're right. You're exactly right. People, people, it's fatigue and they still have that Alabama fatigue and SEC fatigue, but it's been the best conference for over a decade now and they've proven it on the field. But so LSU hasn't beaten Alabama since. This is the last time that Alabama beat LSU, which is crazy. But from this game, in our last episode, we did the 2003 Fiesta Bowl, the national championship game between Ohio State and Miami. We talked about all the NFL talent in that game. Well, that was the only game that outdid this one in terms of future NFL draft picks. Out of this game, 45 players were taken in the NFL draft. That Fiesta Bowl produced 52 draft picks, but this one produced 45. And you looked at it, just even the next year, you had six first-round picks out of this game. Uh, Over the next three years, you had 14 first-round picks from this game over the next three NFL drafts. It's crazy. That's nuts. And also, I'd like to see how many of those first-round picks were defensive linemen. I can tell you. Because there's a lot. Of, you had Brockers yeah. went in 2012. And yep. 2014. No, that was it. That was the only first-round pick was Brockers. He was the only one, really. Oh, sorry. Bing, Mingo. My bad. Overlooked Mingo. Yeah, yeah Mingo. Going to the yeah. Browns. But, yeah, I mean, you had – defensive backs were the story. You had Claiborne, Barron, both drafted uh, first round, along with Drake Kirkpatrick yep. in 2012. You forgot Kirkpatrick was yep. the number. I forgot about Kirkpatrick, yeah. Then you had yep. Milner. And uh, Eric Reed in 2013, your Jets picking Milner, of course. Oh, yeah. T. Milner, baby. And then um, in 2014, you had Haha Clinton Dix go to the Packers. So, really, the story was secondary. I mean, you had, what was that, six guys, seven guys, six guys first round picks out of the secondary from both these teams. Uh, pretty absurd. Yeah. You know, hey, when I think of these defenses, uh, bad job by me. I think of uh, the deep defensive lines that they had. Uh, but hey, when you start dropping those names that you just did from these secondaries, uh, it's, it's incredible. It is. It is. That's that was uh, a little post game note. I mean, at one point, I think 
there's a there was a uh, image going around on Twitter. You've probably seen it. If not, you can probably look for it. It'll probably pop up again over the course of this next week with Alabama and LSU playing again. But uh, there's there's one point where there's a graphic with everybody on the field was an NFL player at some point on on a couple of these different lineups and and, and matchups. So. It was a, an incredible game to watch in that co- course of that game. But the other note about this was it changed the course of college football, too, because the playoff was established two years later. I think a lot of that was because nobody wanted to see a BCS system that would allow two teams from the same conference, albeit the two best teams in football that year, to play for a national championship. Everybody else didn't want to be left out. So the playoff was created soon after. No surprise there. But this game impacted that completely. Quick note on some of the players from this game, how they ended up doing in their career. So Les Miles, we know, this is kind of the beginning of the end for him. Uh, He had some good years, but again, he really didn't adapt his system. Ended up having to leave LSU, come back to Kansas, but he kind of faded. Nick Saban, this, this again, was the beginning, really, of his dynasty. We'll see where it ends, but this would end up being number two and probably maybe the sweetest national championship victory for him than the rematch game against uh, LSU. So many connections there. Player-wise, though, A.J. McCarron, again, I thought he would have had more of a chance in the NFL than he's had, but he's still playing, still a backup. Couldn't unseat Andy Dalton in Cincinnati, but he's there. But the biggest bust, obviously, from this game was the highest pick out of all these players, 45 NFL draft picks. The number one guy out of this group went third overall. That was Trent Richardson. If I would have told you he he would have had an awful career, would you have believed it? No way. No way. And what if I told you that, I know we're not at that no, segment yet. Yeah, so I, I didn't even say it so dramatically, but that that the position Trent Richardson played would become. You look back on it now, and you're like, "Oh, uh, they picked a running back third. You know what I mean? Yeah. Third overall, and it was Trent Richardson who ended up. You know, who, you know he he uh, who ended up. You know, not being any good. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, it's it just incredible uh, the way things turned out for Trent Richardson. Did he have any, you know, I don't really know what the fallout was with him other than, you know, the less than three yard per carry average, which you always hear talked about on the field. Did he have personal problems? Did he, did he, did something happen? I mean, he just kind of had, I think more of like an entourage that kind of was not a good influence on him. I think he lost a lot of his money paying for people and, and spending money on, on other people that, that he probably should have been a little more careful with and had a little more protection over. You know, he actually played in the X, he played in the, not the XFL, the AAF briefly for Birmingham's team and, you know, tried to make a number of comebacks, but never could. It was kind of a disappointing uh, career for him, but no, it wasn't any like no drug issues or domestic abuse, nothing like that. I mean, he didn't have any, any kind of issues like that. It just, I think, Got surrounded by some people that probably weren't looking out for his best interests, and uh, I think it kind of hurt him and his long-term outlook. So uh, that was mo- definitely the most disappointing out of this game. But you know, on the on the LSU side, you know, you look Claiborne uh, Beckham ends up being one of the bigger names out of here. Although he didn't, he had a little bit of an impact in this one, but he was a I believe a freshman in this game anyway. So no surprise. Number thirty-three. Yeah, number thirty-three. Also. Thirty-three. Crazy uh, to see that. But who else in this game? I mean, of note that has gone on to to be really good or or surprised you out of this group? It, it has surprised me. I think he found the right scheme and the right coach. But it, ha- it has surprised me how good Hightower ended up being. Yeah. I mean, he, he's he's been the centerpiece of that New England defense here on, in their renaissance. You know what I mean? Like since, you know, they went to 10 years without winning a Super Bowl. And since, you know, that 2014-2015 time period, uh, he's the one constant that you think of on that defense. Yeah, and I, he, he's been a really a, an overlooked player. I mean, he, he, he was so good, and it was just so big and so fast, which was crazy, the combination. And, yeah, he's, had, he's probably had maybe the – I mean, would you say he's had the best career out of this group uh, just in terms of overall production and, and success and wins and stuff? Or would you um, maybe give it to – you can't say Beckham. I mean, Beckham's had made a lot of money, but I don't know. It's worth the debate maybe for a yeah, later time. Yeah, uh, yeah, maybe – one guy, here. yeah, because none of none of the offensive linemen really panned out. Or really the defensive linemen, honestly. Yeah, Nate yeah, Mingo. maybe he he's been he's had the most impact in big games for sure. Yeah. One guy that surprised me that hadn't turned to turn out to be not not as bad as Ed Richardson, but I thought Kurt, Courtney Upshaw would have a bigger impact. He was just such a really good outside linebacker, edge rusher, but he just finished his career with seven sacks and you know really didn't make much of an impact. And on the he, Ravens he went and, to Baltimore, right? Yeah, it was Ravens and Falcons. And that's especially when Baltimore picks you. It's like, oh, man, yeah. they know what they're doing. Baltimore picked you. And, you know, during this Saban era, and I'm sure you're going to throw someone at me that I'm not remembering right now, <laughs> but they seem to have a lot, a lot of good edge rushers when they're in college. But I can't remember any of these guys ever developing to be good pros. Oh, I'm trying to remember now. now. Edge, edge rushers now, you know? Yeah, no, I know. I'm trying to think. I, I'm going to be probably burned at the stake for not knowing. But, yeah, I mean, nobody just jumps to my mind, and that's... And what is Darius, the best defensive lineman? 
Yeah, I mean, he's been good. I mean, there's been some guys, obviously, recently with um, – He's gotten with, paid the most. Payne I'll tell you and um, Jonathan Allen. But, yeah, I don't, I, I, that's a great question. I, I, there have been some guys, and that's part of the storyline and the narrative that guys are bust for Alabama when they get to the pros. But, you know, you put so many guys out, there's going to be a number of guys that don't meet those expectations. But they've had plenty of guys that have. So, yeah. Does that, is Quinn is – Quinn, let me let – me, I'm, I'm jaded by Alabama players because of D. Milliner, like we talked about before. Can you, is, is Quinn and Williams going to be a bust? Please tell me he's not going to be a bust. I I I would say no. How many guys are getting injured at the Jets though? I mean, you know, Mosley comes over and gets hurt. Been that same way. I, you know, I don't know. It'd be hard to believe that he'd be a bust, but we'll, we'll, it remains to be seen. I'm going to say if no. We passed up on we passed up we passed up on Josh Allen. Yeah. Who has who has just as many sacks as uh, the younger Bosa there in San Francisco, but no one's talking about him because he's in Jacksonville and no one cares. But we passed up on Josh Allen. But let, let's you know not not a Jets podcast, so I digress. <laughs> We'll see. I think he'll be all right. Just give him a little bit of time. But moving on, wrapping this thing up. No need to go social because social media was live at this point. Uh, let's play the what if game real quick by before we wrap it up. So the big what if for me, uh, the block in the back during Barron's interception, had that not happened, Bama probably puts one in the end zone, has a really good shot. They're inside the five. No guarantees in this game, but I like their chances. The other big what if still to me is that Marquise Mays. If he can field that punt in the fourth quarter, and Bama starts the ball at the 45, their own 45, and only has to get 35 yards to have a field goal attempt. It's nothing guaranteed. But just to get that chance, I think that game turn, turns uh, turns out differently. Some what-ifs for me, Marquise Mays related, but the, the drive before that. What if Alabama just kept with what was working? They had no momentum the whole second half up until this drive. You finally get a good Trent Richardson run, and you go away from it. So what if they just kept to what they do? And didn't alter. And, you know, the biggest what if to me in this game is what if the Foster Shelley law firm combination of kickers <laughs> hits two of those field goals? Yeah. You know what I mean? Not even, and, and makes Jarrett Lee or Jordan Jefferson or whoever be a quarterback and play from behind. You know, what, like we talked about before, what if that happens? You know, how does this game turn out differently? Bama, if they could have just hit three of six field goals rather than two of six in this game. Where would they have been? Yeah. Uh, my other is bigger picture. What if Alabama wins this game? Do you think we still get a rematch of Alabama LSU? I don't think that ever really gets talked about much because everybody wants to kind of point at Alabama and say they just kind of get the benefit of the doubt. But to me, I, I still think Alabama does the same thing as LSU in terms of running the table, then beating Georgia in the SEC championship game. And then you're sitting there with LSU who still went on to blow out number three Arkansas in this game in this season after this game with a say a nine to six loss in overtime to Alabama does it still end up the same way with the rematch I think I think if it's if if Alabama wins nine six yeah then yes then yes because you got to remember now like you just said you have LSU getting knocked down definitely lower than three coming back and beating the team Arkansas who was ranked third right you know what I mean so I I think that would have uh that would have vaulted that I think Again, if it was a close win by Alabama, yeah, I think you would have saw the same game. Hmm. Very interesting. So anything else from you on what ifs? No, that's about it. All right, well, let's wrap it up. It's been a longer episode, but it's been a, been a fun one to go back. And, and let me just finish, give you a condo update. So this game wraps up, and I, I, I wasn't handling it well. It was a member. We had been in this emotionally wrecked time of, of, of two feet of snow all week, lack of power, <laughs> right? I'd been I'd been tailgating at a UConn Syracuse football game last time I'll ever do that, and we come back and this game plays out nine to six where Alabama misses four field goals. I believe I'm pretty sure I don't remember. You have to remind me if I kicked you guys out or not. I've been known to kick people out of my condo for games before, but I definitely remember just going outside and there was still snow, still probably 30, 25 degrees outside, and I probably went outside and like my you know, my Alabama polo. I remember sitting in the parking lot, in the back in the parking lot for about 10 or 15 minutes, just like thinking about the game and like the season's over. What a crappy way to finish this season. A very good, like an off, awesome defense. And you're going to ruin it with that performance. I mean, even later, like my now wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, was that was honestly worried about me. She didn't, she like we were, you know, this was a year into our relationship. She didn't really get the full extent. Like she's passionate. She didn't get the full extent of my uh, pulling for Alabama. But she was like le- legitimately concerned that I got frostbite and might be frozen outside in the back, like not able to come back in because I did, didn't answer her phone, didn't take a phone with me, just sat out there for like 10 or 15 minutes just stewing on this game in the freezing cold weather. Don't think I said goodbye to you. If I didn't, I apologize now. Uh, don't think I said goodbye to anybody. I just went walk back inside and probably went to sleep. 
first of all, man, apology accepted. <laughs> Thank you. But but Ben, it's amazing the recollection you have because exactly what happened. I remember like it was yesterday, and me uh, and one of our mutual friends, Artie Sup Art, we talk about this all the time. Whenever we see Alabama LSU, you had it exactly right. You kicked us out. You the last I saw you, you were walking to the back of the parking lot, and that was it. <laughs> That's literally how it happened. That, and it wasn't even that that long of a sequence. You kicked us out. We went out your slider door. We went to our car, <laughs> and you went to the back of the parking lot. Hey, man. Done. A day that started at a UConn football game. It could not have been a worse experience all day long. I mean, no, no offense to my, uh, my UConn and Syracuse friends that might be listening, but, buddy, it was not a fun day. Not a fun day. But it turned out, that the end of that season turned out, and it made me able to go back and, and laugh at it now, but... Quite a moment. That was probably one of the top two or three games that I experienced in Connecticut away from going to a game in Tuscaloosa. So glad we could relive that once again here on the podcast, Mike. If nothing else, it was worth it just to go back and remember the Plainville condo party. <laughs> Absolutely. What an iconic party. You had the gumbo rolling that day. It was uh, it was a celebration of life inside that condo until about, you know, what ten thirty? Uh, midway through the midway through the first quarter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Pins and needles. I forgot about the element of the LSU fan in the building, but yeah, we'll 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 wrap it up on that. No, not to talk anymore and drone on about that. But let me remind you again: make sure you subscribe uh, to on Apple Podcasts, whatever podcasting app you use. To this this podcast, we'd love to have you subscribe. Get the next one delivered to your inbox. Remember, one game every single week we go back and watch and talk about it the same way and relive it. They're not all going to have personal stories like today's did, but they're going to be fun as we go back and relive some of the best ones. And uh, next week we'll go and have a special Thanksgiving uh, episode that we'll we'll dive into over the next couple of weeks. We'll have a little holiday theme, so make sure you subscribe. Leave us a review as well if you would. Rate us and uh, send us an email if you have a game in mind. We had somebody on our YouTube channel request a game, so we'll put that on the list. We appreciate you listening and sending us that. You can also send it to us via email, distantpodcast at gmail.com. And of course, always on Twitter. We, we keep the conversation going there as well. Distant Podcast, you can find us on Twitter there. And on our website, you can watch this game again. A great link, full HD, great quality. Uh, we went back and watched it there. We'll have that on distantreplaypodcast.com. Full show notes there. So let's get out of here, Mike. It's been a little bit longer, man, but I had fun reliving this game with you. Yeah, like 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 Ben said, the personal stuff made this one a little bit longer, but uh, you know we had to get that in uh, a little selfishly. But thanks for listening as always, and uh, we'll catch you guys next week. So that'll do it for us here on the Distant Replay Podcast. <laughs>